Uh, the talk which I'll be presenting today uh, is sort of an, is an effort from our group in Ljubljana. So I work at the University of Ljubljana, so here it's a three, four hour drive to the south. Yeah, so I came by car. Yeah. Uh, and Josef Stefan Institute, so there's people who know Ljubljana. This is, this is two institutions. We are literally across the street, and it's really that a lot of experimental done, work is done at the Josef Stefan Institute, whereas the modeling group where I come from, uh, our group is at, uh, at the faculty. Now, to motivate this work, uh, of course, you all know about the optical use of liquid crystal and their relevance in display applications. Yeah? You, have, you have your laptops here, you have cell phones, right? and we all know that liquid crystals are today used as, as a major display material. And yesterday it was mentioned that you know, but these devices, which we regularly use today, they work at this magic, yesterday we said, uh, millisecond time scales. Yeah? Right? There's, there's some magic number, right? so it works, they work in milliseconds. And the other thing which we also know is that the pixels which we use in our, in our displays, they are usually at the scales of, say, 10 or 20 or some tens of micrometers. Yeah? So this is how we use liquid crystals as optical materials today. This is sort of a, the golden standard. However, what this community also knows is actually that liquid crystals can also do very differently. Right? They don't need to work only at milliseconds. Right? If you don't use director degrees of freedom, but you rather use the, uh, the, the, the scalar order parameter degrees of freedom, so if you use the few, full Q tensor, right? which, we, which was mentioned yesterday so many times, you don't need to work at milliseconds. You can go down to nanoseconds. Yeah? And there are, there's literature out which can show if you go to atomic degrees of freedom, you could reach ultra-fast scales even down to femtoseconds. Okay? So can you see how many orders of magnitude? Yeah? This is what I try to emphasize. The other thing is, so this was time response of a liquid crystal material. And now the spatial response. I said that the pixels which we have in our displays are usually at the scales of, say, 10 micrometers. You all know that we can design liquid crystal films or you know, other type of yeah, patterns which go far beyond or far below these scales. We can design the orientation of a liquid crystal at the scales of, I will not say 10 nanometers, but 100 nanometers for sure. Or, that order of magnitude, and again, so we have here several orders of magnitude down where we can work and design, uh, design and work with the liquid crystal materials. Yeah? This, is the, this is the range of, of the liquid crystal material which is today not exploited. Yeah? And I think there's potential there, and this is sort of the direction which I'd like to go into. Yeah? So this is why I mentioned here photonic crystal metamaterials. So this is all type of, types of applications where you actually design liquid crystal, liquid crystal patterns which are below the wavelength of light. Okay, yeah, this is a typical direction, uh, and this is what I'd like to do. So, uh, before I really go into the talk, I'd like to say, so in our group, uh, so what we work on is sort of, I like to say, sort of four main directions, and today I'll be talking mainly about the photonics applications of liquid crystals, yeah, this is sort of uh, what I'll show today, but there's quite a, an active line of research which we do also on fluidics, of active and passive fluids, so we quite much are interested today on how, say, active pneumatics response, uh, people who are interested in these directions, there's a very close similarity at the level of the models, yeah? of the models which, uh, right, there's a small difference which how you can turn a, the liquid crystal, which we all know about, into an active liquid crystal, so a fluid which moves, moves by itself. Yeah? There's a very small difference between the two systems, so conceptually uh, these systems are very close. So there's, there's quite, a, quite a body of activities here. And then there's the other body of work which we do on what we like to call liquid crystal colloids and structures. Uh, so we also look at assembly of particles, uh, assembly of particle designing objects like fractal colloids, or we look at uh, high order elastic multipoles, and so on. So uh, we, there, there are works which we looked at uh, designing knots in liquid crystals, so knots of defect lines or particles in the shape of knots. So there's quite a, yeah, there's a span of uh, directions which, we could, uh, which one could look at. And there's a, a bit of an industrial uh, or an applied directions which we have in the group, uh, which is on protein aggregation. Yeah? So we look at protein aggregation in the context of biopharmaceuticals. Why is this relevant? Of course, it's relevant from the medical perspective. And I think uh, from what we know, there's some interesting things which we know and are quite interesting, uh, and we can apply them in this context. So I work now, uh, today I'll talk mostly on the, uh, but on the photonics. Now, I'd like to start uh, the talk with this cartoon, uh, and this is something what I'll call, what I'd like to call a word which I'll use, a confined pneumatic fluid. And a confined pneumatic fluid, uh, what I'd like to see it as a combination of two phases. Yeah? This uh, orange and the green one, right? And what will be special about this confined fluid is that this continuum phase, right, 
this will be our liquid crystal. And today I'll be talking about pneumatic liquid crystals. So we all know what's special about them is this, is, this fluid consists of objects which are typically rod-like, yeah? and there are some dimension, they exhibit orientational order. Yeah? This, is, this is the core of this workshop. Now, what we will do with this fluid is we will expose this fluid to what I call, like to call a confinement. So what we will do, we will put objects into this fluid, yeah? colloidal particles if you want, of various shapes and sizes, yeah? but typically of sizes which will be substantially larger than the building blocks of our fluid. Yeah? You know that liquid crystal molecules, the length of this rod is about a nanometer, yeah? order of magnitude, and these objects will be substantially larger. Or what we will do, we can also confine or put the whole fluid into a container, into a cell, or yeah, this is the type of geometry which we already spoken about uh, at the workshop. And really, did, we did many things on these lines, right? This type of confinements. So we looked at 2D crystals, 3D crystals of uh, colloidal crystal of beads, of spheres. We designed defect lines. We looked at Penrose stylings, one can do channels, and so on. Yeah? So there's many, many types of geometries and systems we, which you can look at. Yeah? And at the core of these systems, right, there are also objects. And again, they were already introduced. So these are uh, objects which are called topological defects. So these are regions where our degree of order, so the order parameter, the director order parameter, is broken. Yeah? And this is, in the language of Q-tensor, usually described with, the, with the, the, the degrees in the scalar order parameter of your, of your liquid crystal, the, the S parameter. Now, I said that the confinement which we will use, so the objects or the size of containers, will be substantially larger than the building blocks. This is our rods. Yeah? And I like to show this cartoon, which is drawn in scale. Yeah? So if this is the size of my molecule, and this is a 5 CB molecules. So most of you have, this have some of these molecules in your, in your displays. Yeah? This is one of the components. This is the 5 CB, the famous 5 CB. Yeah? And so if this is my size of the rod, so if I put in yeah, an object which is 10 times the size, that's the ratio, okay? This is how this looks like, yeah? This is my rod and this is my object, which is, this is a nanometer, this is 10 nanometers. This is quite small. But now, what happens is, if you put an object which is 100 times the molecular size, okay, you see? This is now the ratio. This is drawn in, in scale, right? And now, of course, if I now put it one to 1,000, now this will be a mi micrometer sized particle, yeah, you cannot even see that this is actually a spherical particle. It's a wall, okay? And I like to see, I, I like this cartoon because it very much shows you that when we're, we're, we're dealing with objects or confinements which are substantially larger than our building blocks, we don't need to think about individual molecules, but we can rather think about them as line fields. Yeah? We can think about them as sort of continuum fields. Uh, and this is, uh, these lines is what we call the director. Yeah? Yeah? So this is, this is the justification. There's a body of community out, uh, out internationally which looks actually more on the molecular level. Yeah? People worry about the molecules, how they do, how they interact. We heard yesterday about the protein physics. Protein physics, people, people care a lot about the actual effects of the individual, individual molecules. Yeah? So, but in our language, right, so as soon as we go into questions about when we have objects which are substantially larger than, the, than, the, than our rods, than our building blocks, then we, we can just uh, use the continuum fields. And now this talk will be about optics of these materials. Yeah? And something, uh, the language change which we will do is that this director, which I drawn here, is something what I'll start to call an optical axis. Yeah? So what is an optical axis? Yeah? This is at the core of how we use liquid crystal in displays. Yeah? This is at the core of their display application. And this is what I tried to show here, uh, a cartoon of what is the optical response of a pneumatic. Yeah? So what you have here, so this is your director. Yeah? Imagine these are your rods, your molecules. Yeah? They are oriented in this particular direction. And what is special about the pneumatic in optical sense is that it has two refractive indices. Now, if you remember from your elementary courses, yeah, so refractive index is a quantity which determines how light ref refracts or reflects when entering some material. Yeah? So it, it, it's, there's, a, there's something that's called on Snell's law and such things. Yeah? This is something what you will recall from, from other words. So what's special about your pneumatic is that it has two of them, not just one. Okay? And what's called extraordinary in the other in is, is ordinary. Yeah? So, and now, now the things get a bit more complicated, yeah? And this complicated means this is how we use them, okay? Now, it's very important, right? So when you send the light in into a liquid crystal, it's very important at which angle it hits the pneumatic, 
Yeah, so this is my director, and imagine you send light from this direction. Yeah, this is my light, which comes in. Okay, and you see that there's an angle between my direction of the director and my light. Yeah, there's an angle. And now this is not the end of the story. What you have to worry here is about the polarization of the beam, right? So this light which comes in has this specific property of what's called a polarization. Yeah, and what is a polarization? Again, I'll, yeah, I'll call on your yeah, early courses where you, where you learned about what is a light field. Yeah, so light, you remember, is an electromagnetic field. Yeah, it has a, right, which is composed of an, electric, an oscillating electric field yeah, in some plane and magnetic field in the perpendicular plane. Yeah, so if my light beam travels in this direction, my electric field, yeah, say it goes in this direction, and magnetic is just perpendicular. Yeah, this is what you will remember. And then what is the polarization here? Is the direction of the, the electric field. Yeah, it's this direction where E points. Yeah, the direction of E. This is the polarization. Yeah, and this is at the core of all the optics of the uh, which we use with liquid crystals. So now if we go back now, our light coming in into our liquid crystal, so I said there's an angle which is formed here, so what we have to worry about is how is it polarized, so how the light is polarized. And if the light is polarized at this angle, right, see, here, you will see it will experience the external index. But if it is polarized perpendicularly, it will experience an ordinary refractive index, okay? Yeah? And it's really this difference, right? what we do in our displays, we really switch the director so that the light experiences either the ordinary or extra extraordinary index. Uh, this is a, simpli a bit simplified statement, but roughly speaking, true. Right? Uh, yeah? so, and, it's really, so, and this is at the core of what's called a birefringent response of a pneumatic. Okay? So this is how a pneumatic responds to light. Yeah? Uh, uh, how, uh, how it responds to light. And it's really... Uh, that this is, this is the, at the core of these applications of liquid crystals in optics uh, that I want to yeah, uh, talk further on. Yeah? And I want to talk about them in the context of metamaterials. Yeah? Uh, metamaterials, so what are metamaterials? So this community probably knows quite well the mechanical metamaterials. Right? So when you design yeah, a specific building blocks, yeah, specific building blocks, such that you design how the material mechanically, say, imagine, say how it responds to a mechanical force. Yeah? But, uh, right? So you design a stress-strain curve. But here, you actually, what, you, what this, this body, of, uh, this, this community works on is optical metamaterials. We actually design objects which are, at the, which are smaller than the wavelength of the considered light. Yeah? So they are a very much small, small scales. And then you, yeah, you design it here. I hope you can see there's, there's look like sm small colors. This is the first realization of a metamaterial. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then you look how your light responds to such artificially designed, uh, designed material. Yeah? This is an optical material. And one of the high points in this research is looking for negative, uh, uh, negative refraction. Because again, from your high school times, right? You will, maybe you recall that the refractive index always has to be larger than zero. Actually, you will recall that it has to be always larger than one, because refractive index one means that the light propagates at the speed of light, yeah? which we all know about. Yeah? But so, so, so it has to be larger than one, right? Yeah? But actually, what you can show is that effectively, if you create some very intricate patterns, yeah, your light will behave as if the refractive index was smaller, was smaller than one, or as if it was even negative. Yeah? You could do that. Yeah, people could do that. It's not that there's this material has this intricate property, no. This is why I said the, the material, the, the light behaves as if, yeah? It's an effective response of the material, as if the material uh, had a negative uh, refractive index, yeah? And people are trying this in many ways, many different geometries and so on. There's, there's different lines of research and people, people are, yeah, there, there, there's a, a range of directions which we do. Uh, many using metallic components. Uh, I'll say that they're a very uh, active direction today is also all dielectric. Yeah? All dielectric because this uh, reduces the losses of, of, of the material, but this is a bit, yeah, I, won't, I won't go into that. Now, where do the liquid crystals come in into this research? Is, uh, I just, it's really just a selected some of the characteristics, recent characteristics, which I found very fascinating. So materials, liquid crystals, what you can do with them, yeah? people today can design them in a span of interesting directions. One can design them liquid crystal uh, profiles such that they exhibit memory. Yeah? So in this case, you have cavities which are filled with a liquid crystal, and you can show you can imprint, yeah, you can memorize a state of an in such cavities. 
People look at topology of this object. This is topology. This is work from Penn uh, from Penn and, and, and Boulder. Right? One can use talk about the topology of defects. This is a recent work by uh, by Abbott's group. Uh, by Abbott's group, where, for example, they show self-reporting and self-regulating. So what you see here, this is a medical application. When they press with the finger here on this cavity, I hope you can see this red dot. Right? When you press it, it heats the region locally, and this light, uh, this red dye, in this case dye, gets released. Right? So this is a drug application. The idea is drug application. So you just press your finger, and your drug, uh, in this case, it's just a, uh, a red dye, uh, it gets released into a system. Yeah? And it's based on a manipulation of a, of a liquid crystal. Yeah? And this is some metamaterial applications. So uh, this is ideas of really using, uh, using uh, uh, metamaterial concepts in, uh, for guiding light. This is a work from Kent. Here I cite the work by, uh, uh, by, 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 Peter, by Peter here in the audience, right? where they use uh, golden nanorods to, uh, to tune how the light propagates, in this case, through a sample of golden nanorods. Yeah? So it was not the molecular objects I showed about, it was golden nanorods. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, this here, the idea was that you could decade yeah, how, how, this, how this research is explained that they can actually very much control how the light goes around such central electrode, even making objects, uh, I use a popular word, right, yeah, invisible. Yeah, invisible. Yeah? Uh, uh, and uh, so this is, uh, and there's a body of work where people look at uh, metasurfaces. This is work from Southampton, uh, UK, uh, where they really design such surface, surface profiles, and they, they cover them then with a the pneumatic and tune the response uh, uh, in, in different ways. Now, so this is sort of the context, okay? And now I want to show you a little bit uh, our contributions here. So I'll first show you a bit of the methodological approaches we do, and then I'll show, uh, then I'll show you some, some of the results uh, uh, from, recent, from recent years. Now, in order to model the liquid crystal profiles, yeah, so how the pneumatic yeah, or, uh, organizes in such a confined geometry, what we use is free energy minimization. So this is a method which, you know, people which is in the community, all I think, for, for, for a substantial amount of time. Yeah? So essentially what we do, we start with the lambda de Gen free energy in Q tensor form. So here I write it just with a single elastic constant. We can do more. We do three, three if you want, no problem. Just takes a bit more time. Depends what you want. Right? Then there's the standard, standard lambda term. We, introduce, we use different surface coupling terms. This is just the standard uniform anchoring. You can also do degenerate, you can do tilted, uh, all options you want, okay? So this is things which, uh, which, can regular, which, which can regularly change. So this free energy, we minimize it typically on a, on a, on a grid, on a cubic grid, using um, finite, finite differences. So essentially, we use explicit relaxation. So people who are, who are numerics people, they will know this is sort of the, the basic and simplest approaches you can do. Uh, and uh, I say, yes, very true. But what it turns out that these approaches are very, these relaxation approaches are extremely robust. And also this, this free bonus which you get is that actually a relaxation approach, a numerical relaxation approach, really mimics how the dynamics of a liquid crystal. This is a small bonus which you get for free just by choosing your, uh, your, your method. Of course, neglecting the effects of the material flow. Yeah? This is a bit of a, a, a bonus. And here, by doing that, we can get uh, equilibrium profiles of the Q-tensor in different geometries I mentioned before. We, of course, can calculate the total free energy of the system, which you can then compare for different parameters and so on, looking at interaction potential and so on. And of course, you can look or get also the equilibrium positions of the particles. Yeah? Then you can tune into this. You can introduce also effects of uh, different surface terms, also external fields and so on. Yeah? These things are regularly done. And, and we did that in, in a body of applications. This is just, just one uh, where we spoke a little bit more about the model. Now, in view of the light modeling, yeah? this is a little bit of a newer thing for us. Is, uh, we invested a little bit in developing two, two approaches developing, I mean, using them, yeah? And the first one is uh, find a difference time domain method. So this is a method which is quite well known in the community of people who do light modeling, but mostly today in isotropic systems, yeah? So optically isotropic, so where there's only one refractive index, and there are solvers which you can just buy commercially, yeah? And what do you do here? Uh, you, actually, what you do, you solve directly the Maxwell's equations. Yeah? So people who you will recognize, so I, I teach electromagnetism, okay, and the under, for the undergrads, right? so I have to know this well, okay. So, uh, uh, so uh, essentially what you do directly, you solve the, the Maxwell's equation in full time-dependent form, okay? Full, uh, and where is the complexity in this system? Is you will realize that, of course, this Maxwell's equation depends on your, on your, uh, the electric permittivity, yeah? which in this case is a tensor, and it's also a tensor which is spatially dependent. 
Okay? Yeah? So your Q, yeah? here you will see your Q tensor. Yeah? This is your Q tensor. This is how it relates to the electric primitivity. Yeah? So this is, they are just connected. They are roughly the same, yeah? uh, ex except for, for some constant. Yeah? Except, except for some constants. And this is really where, where the complexity comes in uh, for solving this type of, uh, type of equations. We can also solve them in the combination with the free energy minimization. Yeah? So they talk to one another, the systems talk to one another, and this is an iterative approach. People who do that will, will know that uh, there's, uh, there's some homework which you have to do in terms of ass uh, assuring accuracy of this and also stability of these methods. So you have to worry about how you choose your mesh, how you choose your boundary conditions, and so on. Yeah? There's, some, there's homework here, and I'll, I'll happy to say something more. Now, the other, the other method which we do for optic simulations is now not the time domain method, but the frequency domain method. Yeah? So here, uh, actually, you will see that we remove this explicit dependence on time, yeah? explicit dependence on time, to change it into a frequency dependence, yeah? assuming. Yeah? And uh, then, essentially, what you do, you rewrite your systems of equation, Maxwell's equation, into what you will recognize as sort of a generalized, people like to call this a, a wave equation. Yeah? We like to call this a wave equation. And again, well, saying that, right, again, I should say, it's not a standard wave equation because this epsilon, right, this is the electric primitivity, right, this depends on your liquid crystal orientation, right? And this is a spatially dependent field, right? Your Q tensor describes all this fancy orientation of your pneumatic in a complex, yeah, confined geometry, right? And it's this spatially dependent tensor which you now have to plug in here. Yeah? Which you have to plug it in and then solve this and you will recognize this is, some, this is a form of a generalized uh, uh, eigen problem. Yeah? So you have to solve, uh, you have to solve, uh, solve essentially, essentially uh, uh, a bit of a complex uh, Eigen problem, yeah? and you can do that. Yeah? You can do this by assuming uh, uh, generalized block formalism and so on. So there's, there's again, there's again literature on that. Uh, it's bit, one has to think a little bit how you choose the eigenframes and so on. Yeah? This is uh, a little bit of a yeah, something uh, what you can do. Now, uh, uh, now going to the results. Uh, so the first one I would like to show you is how to use uh, how to use colloidal objects in this case of such horseshoe shape essentially as metamaterials. Yeah? So this is a, a, a colloidal particle. Colloidal particle, we will take it as a metallic. Yeah? Assume that it's golden. Yeah? We'll take material properties of a gold. Yeah? And then put this into a pneumatic. Yeah? And of course, if you put such a particle into a pneumatic, the first thing, of course, you ask, what, how, how will it organize? Right? What will it do? Right? At which angle will it go? Right? And because it's quite asymmetric, there's quite some homework which you have to do how it organizes. Yeah? And we, we calculate free energy for all different geometrical parameters and so on. Yeah? And, uh, well, of course, well, we need to conform different, different angles. But, and, uh, right? but saying that, right, we won't be interested in just a single particle. We want, we want to use this as a metamaterial. Right? And as a such, we want to organize it into a larger structure, in this case, into a, a colloidal crystal. So you want to have essentially symmetric configurations of these particles. Because otherwise, when you put, put them together, right, when they form aggregates, uh, aggregates, you will get very asymmetric solutions, and that's not something you want, because you will get, end up in metastable solutions, and that's something which uh, uh, this system very much likes to do. So you have to worry a little bit uh, how they organize and look for symmetric solutions. That's something what we can do. And really here, because it has quite substantial, uh, there's quite a few your geometrical parameters you can optimize, you can do that, right? There's, this particle will align, you see, along the director, so this gris gray line, try to show the far field director, yeah? and if you choose this shape, particular one, it will align along the director, but if you use a different particle shape, yeah, you see here, yeah, it's thinner and higher, right? uh, it will uh, orient along 45 degrees with respect to the director. Yeah? You can play with that just by tuning the geometry. There's some optimization homework here which you have to do, eh? but you can do that, right? You can look at the free energies and so on. This is your homework. Uh, now, and if you do that, right, uh, and actually it turns out that if you take these two, uh, we try this one and this one, right, you can actually assemble these particles into larger structures. So what you see here is actually a 2D colloidal crystal, yeah? So this is each of the particles which sits in a liquid crystal cell. So this is my cell geometry. We spoke about this already, yeah? And then you have a layer of these particles sitting in the middle of the cell. Yeah, forming, forming such a lattice, and actually, it turns out if you make this layer, your pneumatic cell thicker, uh, they can also form uh, a, a 3D colloidal crystal. Essentially, they like to stack. Yeah? They like to stack. Yeah? Uh, they like to stack, and they form such structures. So this is a, a liquid crystal colloidal homework. Yeah? So essentially, you have, you have to work how this assembly works, yeah? and it's, it's, a, uh, it's about the minimization of the free energy. Uh, and we show that you can make 2D or 3D colloidal crystals. 
Now, but now the question is, how do they respond optically? Yeah? Uh, and what we do now is really, so we take such geometry against cells, and then we send light on that. Yeah? Essentially, we send, uh, imagine you have a, yeah, a white light beam, you send light on the systems, and then you look at, so what I show you here, so here in the center, this is your particle, yeah, at some time, yeah, some time, and this, when time progresses, yeah, this is at different times, and then what this gray and dark show you is the profiles of your electric field. Yeah? So essentially, here you see how the electric field changes because of the presence of the particle. And now if you do your homework, right, and you look at the electric field, you look at the magnetic field, and now if you do your homework, you actually see that, this, that, there, that there, what happens is with such a particle, you observe a resonance forming. So essentially you see a resonance form, forming at the particle, so there's a very much, so, so your response very much depends on the frequency, yeah? on the frequency of light that you're sending, sending on your system. Yeah? Uh, on the system, and actually we see three references, and you can talk about the characteristic modes and so on. Yeah? This is people who do metamaterials, they very much worry about that. Yeah? And there's implications how you could use that. If, if you observe such resonances, this is usually the regions where you could aim and think about using them, in, say, in, say, in the context of negative refraction. Yeah? This is what you want. You want the resonances. And now, if this was one layer of particles, this was individual particle, you can do now the, the, the whole colloidal crystal, yeah, the whole colloidal crystal. And this is, for example, how the, light, how the electric field changes when you go uh, through, uh, through the crystal. Uh, so it's very much, there's a, a very, very strong dependence. And again, you can talk about the resonance, uh, resonance behavior of the system. Something what the liquid crystal gives you inherently is because, because you know you can reorient your pneumatic, right? And if you do so, right, if you reorient it or change the temperature, so you change your refractive index, uh, you can also tune the resonance. Uh, so you can tune the resonance. This is something what other systems, you know, isotropic, are, they, they cannot do so, so easily right, as here when we have uh, such a soft, uh, a soft system. Uh, yeah? And uh, you, you can explain this type of behavior with simple models, and people try to do that, yeah? And this is, uh, you think about the inductance and capacitance of such systems, so one can actually ascribe to these modes uh, such as, as if they were behaving as capacitors or as coils, and this is, by writing such simple models, one can then uh, talk about the resonance or just give, try to give an, give an uh, more of a qualitative explanation of what you really see in the, in the full picture. Yeah, so this is sort of a, a one, one possible line. Now, I spoke about negative refraction, and this is again uh, something what I like. And now I want to show you how this negative refraction really works. Okay, so what you will be looking at is now at the refraction of light at the boundary between. Imagine you have, here you have air, and here you have your liquid crystal. Yeah, you have your liquid crystal, right? Yeah? At some given angle. Yeah. So imagine here is this is my direction of my director will be like that. Okay. It has this ordinary extraordinary index I spoke about. Okay. I mean, yeah. Uh, this is something what's special. Yeah. And the interesting thing which we will do is we will say that what if one of these indices is negative? Yeah. So today in the materials we use, this NE and NO are always positive. This is all the liquid crystal that exists today. But uh, I'll ask the question: What happens if one of these is negative? Yeah? yeah? Can we? Yeah? And there's, of course, the question can we make such materials? That's, this is something I'll ask Peter to help me answer right? <laughs> if this question comes in. Right? So, what, and if you could do that, what happens? Yeah? And this is what I show here is that what happens if I change my optical axis from this, so this is my director, to this? Right? And this is my light coming in, so what you see here is white, so my light comes in like that. It's, a, it's imagine you have your laser, right, which you point in this direction, and this white. Uh, white regions, this is the, yeah, your electromagnetic waves, yeah, which come in, yeah? and you see that if you have your optical axis at some angle, so if you have your director like this, light will reflect like this, or it will reflect like that, okay? And if I now show you a little bit more of the homework, right, so what, the only thing which I'm changing here is the direction of my director. Here it's like that, like that, like that, okay? Hope you can see different directions, and you will see that I can completely change how my light refracts at the boundary. So below the dashed line is my air, my light comes in, what happens? So if, it's, if the director is this angle, it gets totally reflected. If the director is like this, yeah, you see positive refraction. If you change your angle of, of your director, you get negative refraction. Yeah? So, okay, okay, so just, just by changing your, uh, your uh, direction of your director, you can completely change refractive behaviors. 
Yeah? And this has implications. Right? This is sort of the simplest geometry you could cook up. Yeah? Uh, you, could, uh, you could use. And, uh, this is a, and essentially, if you now do, yeah, try to put this together, you can work, work out an equivalent version of what's known as the Snell's law. Yeah? You all know the Snell's law for, for standard optics. Now, uh, actually, it turns out you have to do a little bit of more numerical homework, uh, but you can actually work how the, how the incoming beam is, is related to the outgoing beam as a function of your direction angle. Yeah? This is what these angles talk about. And I'll just say, yeah, well, yeah. there's regions of positive refraction, negative refraction. There are regions of total reflection. So yeah, you have the whole richness, richness of the behavior for the tuning of your material. Now, this is a recent work, which is, uh, which is unpublished. It's, so far, I showed you that, that the director was always homogeneous. So your director was everywhere the same. But well, here, what, I've show, what, what we looked at is what if your liquid crystal yeah, metamaterial has a, a pattern? Yeah? In this case, what if you create a plus one defect here in the center? Or what if you create a minus one defect here in the center? And again, what you do, you send your light in yeah, at this point. Yeah? You send it in. And then see what happens with the light beam. Yeah? Light beam, in this case, yeah, it doesn't go straight. It just follows yeah, some interesting trajectory, and it gets attracted to the position of your central defect. Yeah? Uh, of, of your defect. So this is the standard intensity plotted. This is in log, in log scale, yeah? so that you can see better uh, where the light goes. And now if, you change, yeah? and now if you change your director to a minus one, you see that actually the light gets deflected from the center. So essentially, by designing the patterns of a liquid crystal in systems where you could make one of the external or the extra ordinary or extraordinary index negative, you could really, yeah, you could do transformation optics. This is again a large field where you actually design, you guide your light, yeah, uh, in space, and this is this is the field which people call invisibility. Yeah, this is invisibility. Yeah, invisibility clocks. That's the type of phenomena which people try to, to try to devise. Uh, now, the, uh, uh, the first topic which I want to mention is now light propagation in what's known as heliconical uh, liquid crystal pool profiles. So there was mentioned yesterday again, cholesteric liquid crystals were mentioned. So when the liquid crystal, uh, your pneumatic is not just uniformly aligned, but it forms a helix. Uh, it forms a helix. Actually, it turns out that recently, uh, uh, in the group of uh, Kit Kent, right, in Oleg Laurentovich, uh, here again, Peter, you have Peter here. Uh, uh, they actually uh, they were able to realize cholesteric patterns where where the liquid crystal didn't do just a helix, but they actually had also a tilted component. Okay, so it's not that there's just a helix, yeah, like that, but it, uh, this helix is is like that, it's tilted. Yeah, so this is the pattern I want to show you. Yeah, so this is how your molecules oriented. Yeah, so they still, yeah, rotate. And you go along some axis, but they form a constant tilt along the axis of your rotation. Yeah? And this is called a heliconical, uh, a heliconical pattern. Yeah? And why it's interesting. Yeah? And you, people think about it in the context of uh, this type of free energy. Yeah? This is their work, not, not so I'll, 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 just, I'll just put a reference there. Yeah? Uh, uh, just, just a reference there. And why these materials are interesting is because by changing the electric field, they can actually change the tilt angle. Yeah? So how, how much these molecules are tilted with respect to the axis of rotation? Yeah? Uh, uh, this is something they can do, and by ch changing that, actually it turns out you're changing the color of your material. Okay? So you can tune the color, uh, the, the color of material, so this is the key, the key property of, of, of such a heliconical material. Yeah? Heliconical material, and uh, how does it... Yeah, how, how different is the color, right? So how these materials behave in, in an optics language, you would call them, they perform as one-dimensional uh, photonic, photonic crystals. Yeah, this is a photonics language. And what is special is how, what is the relation between the incoming light and the outgoing light, yeah? It turns out there is a region yeah, where the light cannot propagate. Yeah? The light cannot propagate, so such systems has a partial band gap. Yeah? We can, I can be more careful about that. Uh, and we, we show, uh, and actually, what we calculate here is how these band gaps yeah, and how this refracted light depends on your tilt angle. Uh, on your tilt angle, and actually show, uh, we can show the, the range of band gaps, uh, so the, the region of wavelengths which will only be able to propagate through such a system yeah, as a function of the tilt angle or as a function of the pitch of your system. And there actually exists an analytical formula which we gave into the paper uh, what, about the edges 
of these bands. It's a straightforward uh, thing to do. If you do your homework and think a bit about the dispersion relation, you can get the analytical formula for that edges. Something what optical people will be interested in is also what are the eigenmodes in the system. So what are the, what are the eigenmodes of the light in such a, such a profile? And you see that it's actually your electric field yeah, has such sine component. Yeah, it rotates when you go yeah, uh, when you go along the beam. So electric field, the eigenmode is such a such a sinusoidal or cosine uh, rotation. And what's different now, because you change from a cholesteric yeah, to a heliconic, is that you obtained also a component of your electric field along the axis of propagation. This is quite in optics quite uncommon. Yeah? So it's quite uncommon, and you see you can observe modes which are, have constant this effect or which can even show oscillations. Yeah? And as a result of that, what your light does, right? so imagine if you would send light in, yeah? uh, if you send light into such a heliconical system, what you have to very much worry is about the commensurability of your system. Because if you imagine, uh, there's two things which you have to think about. One is the wavelength of your incoming light, and the other one is the wavelength, is the pitch of your heliconic. Yeah? And if they are commensurate, yeah, this light pattern yeah, will behave differently or as if they're incommensurate. Yeah? They can either close in, the modes can close in, or they cannot. Yeah? Uh, they cannot. And this is, uh, so we see quite uh, such interesting rotation. Here, this is uh, a pointing vector. Essentially, it's about how the light energy propagates in the system. So it really shows you about the commensurability of your, of your modes. And this is... Uh, uh, the, last, uh, the last topic which I want to show you, and this is a work, an experimental collaboration with a group of, uh, uh, at, Oxford, at Oxford Engineering. This is Steve Morris and Steve, Steve Elston. So the experiments were done at Oxford modeling uh, with it in Ljubljana. Yeah? Uh, and uh, so what's here, the issue? So what's the, what's, the, what's the interesting topic here? So essentially, we want to, uh, yeah? what we want to devise is objects or microstructures which, uh, yeah, uh, uh, which would essentially be, so which optically could be turned on and off. Yeah? So essentially what I would like to create microstructures which at some, which some parameters will be visible and at some other parameters will be not visible. Yeah? And, yeah, in the, in the, and so what we do here, essentially, so this is what, where the Oxford group is really good at. So essentially what you see here, this is a scheme of a cell. So again, you have your liquid crystal cell. And what they do here, they shine in with the laser light, yeah, like this. And what they can do is that they can in situ polymerize such a pillar. Yeah? So essentially, your liquid crystal is not just rods, it's not just basic rods, but inside you have also a reactive polymer. People can do that. Okay? You can create polymer, and if you choose the right polymer and you choose the right light, what can happen is that if you illuminate this polymer with light, this this polymer will freeze in, yeah? it will essentially will solidify, it will create a solid object. Yeah? It will polymerize. Yeah? It will form plastics, okay? in, in more popular language. Yeah? Uh, uh, yeah? uh, so, and it's really, so, and why they are really good at is they can really, they, this, yeah? and you can write this. So now imagine you move your laser, yeah? you can write these objects yeah? in different ways. And this is, this is a technique uh, which they develop, and this is something which will go into the language of 3D printing. Yeah? This is 3D printing in animatic. Now, why this, this approach is so much better? Because the nozzle, right, yeah, the fine yeah, the tip of the printing setup is, say, an order of magnitude in all directions smaller than the commercial ones. Okay? Yeah? You can buy one in a shop yeah? Yeah? So you can, to get it in your lab. So why they're really good at this, 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 this precision of the objects they can make is an order of magnitude smaller. That's what they can do. Okay? They're quite smart. Yeah? Well, and so they can create really very tiny pillars. And of course, they can create yeah, uh, different ones and different patterns and so on. Now, in view of this application, which I want to show you now, what's important is, is to think about two voltages. So I told you we have a cell. And there will be two voltages. One will be called writing, and the other one will be a read voltage. Yeah? So when they write this pillar, yeah, they can write this pillar already in the case when they have already applied some voltage to the cell, okay? So if you have a zero volt in your cell, your cell will be oriented like that, okay? You have uniform pneumatic. But now if you apply a voltage, your, your cell will orient like that. Uh, and this is very, and, uh, and then, then you can do in between, right? And now what is important is that, now this is now the situation in which I will write my pillar, 
Okay? And what happens if, when you write your pillar, yeah? so if you start in this case, your pillar will actually memorize the direction of your surrounding pneumatic. Okay? So essentially, in, in modeling language, it will memorize the anchoring direction. Yeah? So anchoring direction on the surface of your micro object will be dependent on your actual state when the surface was formed. Okay, so and if you create a different pattern of your pneumatic, your surface anchoring profile will be different. Okay, this is what they can do. So, and so depending, right, so, the, so you can create, if you create a pillar at zero volts, it will memorize this direction, but you create a pillar at eight volts, it will, uh, it will uh, me memorize, the surface anchoring will memorize this direction. Yeah, so uh, now, uh, right, and they can really make them. Yeah, this is a, this is a, a micro image of that, uh, of the such objects. And now you want to ask the question, I want to now to read this image. Yeah? So what you see here is an image which of one pillar, yeah? here you can see it, which was written at four volts. Yeah? It was written at four volts, yeah? but now what I will do, I will read this image at zero volt, one volt, two, three, four, or five volts. Yeah? And what you see is that, that if, you, if you read this image at zero volt, of course you can see the pillar, here it is. One, two, three. But if you read it at four volts, you cannot see the pillar. Okay? You cannot see the pillar, right? And the reason is because the birefringence of the object itself and the surrounding birefringence match. Yeah? Because they match, the op this object is optically hidden. Of course it's there, but because the surrounding birefringence and the birefringence of the object itself, they match, and this is how you make it invisible. Okay? Uh, uh, invisible, uh, invisible, and then I can do, of course, if you know it for how to do it for one pillar, you can do more. They do six, this is an array yeah, of pillars where each column was written at a different voltage. Yeah? First one is at zero, one, and so on. And you see that now when we read this image, at zero volts, the first line of, of pillars is invisible. Now when you move the read voltage, yeah, you see that you can control which of the objects uh, you start you start to see and this is yeah, and this is something which we this is experimental we, we, we calculated this so so we can confirm how, how it works and you can really see that when the read voltage is equal to the right voltage this is when you have the largest contrast and you see the objects right and there's of course some precision and accuracy with how, how, how precise is this thing yeah? yeah you can do so essentially you you realize something what we'd like to say cloaking yeah, cloaking, and this works also for uh, also for polarized and unpolarized light. So this is for people who do optics. It's, it's quite important. And now, uh, really, can we create some uh, devices or structures? Yeah. So this is uh, this is something what they like to play with. Okay. So here you see a QR code. Yeah, a QR code where the pillars were written at different voltages. Yeah. So you can see that you can make. Yeah, you can actually make, yeah, so this is, this, is, oh, this is all the pillars visible. You see here at five volts, some pillars are visible, some are not. Yeah? So you can actually actively tune yeah, what you see and what you don't. Yeah? What you not, and this is, uh, uh, this is, so here again, this is a bicycle, the, uh, 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 this uh, John, right? Uh, he was, uh, he's an active cyclist, right? So he wanted, he wanted to, to draw, to draw an image of a bicycle where you can see huh, that we can really control the intensity of different even spikes. So here the idea is that when you change the voltage, you will want to look how these spikes move. Okay? It works to, to a fair degree, okay? To a fair degree, uh, uh, to a fair degree, and uh, a fair degree, and you can you can design smiley places, uh, faces and so on, right? When again by changing just changing the voltage. Huh? In a in a way you, you smartly design uh, uh, your your pillar objects. So with this, uh, I will conclude. So I tried to show you today uh, four lines of work uh, on uh, where how liquid crystals could be used as optical materials. The first one was to use them uh, really colloidal objects uh, as metamaterials. So you make colloidal particles which are of the sub, sub wavelength scales and actually look at the resonant behavior. Then I wanted to, to talk about a little bit what happens if you could design a liquid crystal pattern which had a negative, one of the eigen indices was negative. Then it was light propagation in heliconical birefringent profiles, where it's really about the tunability of your photonic crystal response. And then it's this last one, it's about the cloaking. Yeah, it's the cloaking of micro object by matching the surrounding birefringent with the birefringence of the, of the micro objects. With this, I conclude, and thank you. So maybe time for one quick question. I know that's inhibiting. Peter. You, you mentioned that light materials rely on resonances. Resonances carry losses with them. You didn't say much about losses. That's very true. Can you say something about 
how big the impact of these might be. So the work which I presented was really on the metallic systems. So it was really about the metallic. Uh, 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 so here, this is an image which, I, which, I, which, I, which I'll show you. Right? So here, this is essentially electric field. So electric field squared. So this is intensity as a function of depth, so of the size of your crystal. So this is, the, this is at zero. This is the, in, the light incoming at your colloidal crystal, so coming in. And then this is the number of layers. So, so what you see is that, the, of course, the intensity of light drops substantially. It actually drops exponentially, which is something you will expect because this is a, metal, is a, is a metallic system. Saying that, right, so true, so the intensity goes down substantially, right, so realistically these things work probably for, I don't know, yeah, maybe up to 10, 10 layers. More than that, it won't work, yeah, because you just you lose your light. And this is a common, this is a major challenge which the whole metamaterial field is aware of, right, so it's, it's something just to say it. Uh, now, saying one more thing here is I'll say that... Uh, there's a very a line of in metamaterial research which I'm quite interested in, and I didn't talk about it, is where you look at all dielectric metamaterials. So essentially, here we assume that these objects are metallic, but actually, if you can design objects which have high, uh, high, uh, high contrast in the refractive indices, so say you could create your object which has a refractive index of 8 or 9 or 10, with respect to one or two of the liquid crystal, there you can also get resonances. You, you don't say explicitly resonances, but you get, you get resonant, resonant mode, and essentially you can also get, go to regimes of negative refraction. So to my opinion, I mean, the, it's the, the old dielectric metamaterials which have a, have a high potential also for such more bulk, uh, bulk applications. <laughs>